Hello, this presentation is on the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the field of psychometrics and assessment. Many people don't realize it, but uh, psychometrics and assessment is actually one of the innovation leaders in the topic of AI and machine learning. As we will see, it's been actually been around for quite a long time and we are one of the first proponents of it. So this presentation will start by talking about uh, some of that history and then we'll get into some current research topics and some future opportunities. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Nathan Thompson. I am uh, the CEO of Assessment Systems, a uh, provider of software for developing, delivering, and validating assessments. Um, there's different types of platforms that we support, so you can see some of them here, FastTest, AssessAI, TestAssembler, iDemand, Excalibur. Um, they fill different roles within the process of developing and validating assessments. Um, there are very specific tools for very specific things, but there are also big comprehensive platforms too, like FastTest and AssessAI. So I did my uh, graduate work at the University of Minnesota, where I did some teaching there, as well as some teaching at the University of Cincinnati. But most of my work has been in the private sector, I worked at a nonprofit certification board, a big testing company, and then here at Assessment Systems. So first of all, if you're new to the topic, a little bit about what is psychometrics. Um, so psychometrics is trying to use science, the scientific method, mathematics, statistics, technology, data science, all these things to improve assessment. Because assessment actually serves a very, very important purpose in the world. It provides useful information about people. It provides information about what a fifth grader should learn next in their math class based upon how they scored on the previous um, session. Uh, it provides information about who to hire, uh, who is the best people to let into a university. Um, after their are in university, what level of mathematics or English course should we put them into? Uh, are they certified to work in a, a job or uh, gain a license to work in a profession once they're out in the workforce? Um, you know, now it's even branching into other areas like providing surveys to people after they receive nurse knee surgery to see how well they're recovering from knee surgery. Uh, so there are a lot of places that assessment can provide very good information about people and do so more cost effectively than interviews. You know, and we usually think of interviews as a, a job and, uh, entrance thing, but they're actually not very accurate there. And there are other types of interviews too. Um, keeping that same example of a knee surgery, um, you could have people drive into the doctor's office every week after knee surgery and be interviewed by a doctor or a nurse, or you could have them take a survey that's been validated and to show them the same or similar results. And they can just sit at home, take it on their tablet and be done in five minutes. Uh, which of those is more cost effective for the health insurance industry? Uh, and psychometrics is actually an engineering situation. Uh, it, it takes a complex cross-functional team to develop a good assessment. Uh, our goal here is to make uh, an assessment that is high quality and has reliability, precision, and validity. A uh, big portion of that is having a defined process with documentation. That is really what validity comes down to is documenting that you did a good job and why you did certain things. Um, it's very heavy in mathematics. Uh, those of you who are new to it, um, uh, if you want to get into it, there's a lot of nonlinear uh, regression and that sort of thing. And it's also very tech heavy. Um, even when I learned it, it was learning different pieces of software. But nowadays, if you want to get into psychometrics, you're probably going to have to learn how to code in R and Python. So what is psychometrics? Again, it, well, it answers some big questions about what goes on in developing and delivering an assessment. First of all, we got to decide what is on a test. What is the test supposed to cover? That's actually a really big question. In the case of education, it's kind of defined for you because you can just look at the curriculum that's already been defined by your uh, government. But in like a certification exam, if you're certifying you know, sports chiropractors, what do people need to know to be, on, to be a sports chiropractor? Well, we're probably going to have to do what's called a job analysis and survey a bunch of chiropractors and see what they do and use that data to decide what's on the exam. Uh, psychometrics is involved in setting a defensible cut score. Um, it's easy to send an indefensible cut score, like picking a round number like 70%. Um, but that's not going to hold up in court. You have to use standard setting methods like the Angoff or the Buke or the Bookmark method to set a defensible cut score. Uh, we have to document that our tests and our items are good, that it, they have good statistical qualities, um, that you know people aren't getting the question right all the, or wrong all the time because it's got a bad answer or something like that. You have to show all that. 
Uh, we have to answer whether maintaining scores across forms or years is comparable. That is, you know, if your country has a university admissions exam, uh, does a score of 600 this year mean the same as a score of 600 last year mean the same as a score of 600 seven years ago? That's actually a really big problem to solve. Um, how do we make scores more accurate um, so that you know, we can take out items that are not performing well and focus on items that are performing well? How do we make tests shorter and more engaging? Um, how do we use gamification, let's say? It's, there's a lot of new things that go on in assessment here that are not just traditional. And how do we provide better feedback for assessment, uh, the examinees after they finish the assessment? So what we'll talk about here today uh, is introducing some of the cutting edge topics regarding AI and machine learning in the world of psychometrics and assessment. First of all, by demonstrating how we've actually been a leader in this for over a century, um, and then we'll get into the actual uh, current topics and talk a little bit about those. But first of all, let's start with some definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, number one, what is machine learning? Well, machine learning is making mathematical models to describe or predict data um, using usually some sort of large data set. It might be a small data set, but usually it's large. And these models then are usually used for practical purposes. They're not just done for the sake of analyzing data. And there's different types of machine learning that you can see in this uh, cool diagram that I found online. Uh, there's unsupervised learning, which is just looking for patterns in data. And there isn't a criterion variable that you're actually trying to predict or do something with. Supervised learning means that there is a criterion variable that you're trying to do something with. For example, predicting job performance or predicting success in university. Um, and reinforcement learning is trying to do the one or two of the others in real time and updating the machine learning models. Artificial intelligence is uh, broadly defined as doing things that have required humans to do in the past. It's often using those machine learning models that we just talked about, uh, but it doesn't have to, um, but pretty much usually does now. Um, and when you think about AI, you need to remember that it's often something we're thinking about whatever is five years ahead. In the 1970s, people were excited to have the computer play Pong against them. And they thought, oh, wow, this is great AI, great AI. And then, you know, we had um, uh, more complex games coming in the 80s or 90s, and being able to play against them was still quite useful. Um, and now AI has just exploded and is available in much more complex things. And you can do things like write new blog posts, um, recognize faces, do OCR of um, handwritten responses for essays and turning them into uh, real data. There's a lot of work that can be done with AI. Automation is also pretty important. And that's basically taking computers to automate some well-defined workflow. Um, so you can kind of think of weak AI, and it certainly makes humans more effective, more efficient, um, but it doesn't necessarily use machine learning models. It's taking you know, some workflow like you see here and writing software to make it a lot easier to implement that workflow. Uh, natural language processing is another uh, thing it, that's used quite often. Uh, it's a combination of artificial intelligence, computer science, and linguistics. Basically, it's taking language data and trying to turn it into easily tractable or analyzable data that we can use for other things. An example of machine learning and AI is handwriting recognition. Uh, this is one of the simplest examples. If you take a course, you'll see some work on this. And really what they try to do here is they tr try to take uh, an image and they convert it into a numerical array. So you can see the number six here in a handwritten image. If you think about it in terms of uh, ones and zeros for whether it's black or not within a certain pixel of the image, it becomes the ones and zeros you see on the right. Well, we can turn that ones and zeros into a single vector array and do things with that single vector array. Um, for example, we can train machine learning models to recognize the number six based upon relatively similar patterns of the ones and zeros. Now to do that, we have to label all of the images in a training set. So a training set is a data set that's used to um, train the machine learning model to actually uh, calibrate it. And then once we have that model, uh, we can apply that at scale and use it for things like handwriting recognition. Another example, um, for those of you who are fans of the TV show Silicon Valley, which I'm a big fan, is image recognition or image detection. Um, and in that TV show, they wrote uh, image detection algorithm for 
uh, food identification, but the, uh, the joke of it was that it only did one decision, and that was hot dog or not hot dog. Uh, and it's basically what we saw before with the, uh, the handwriting, but now they're looking at colors in the pixels and not just ones or zeros for whether it's black or white. Uh, but they can still do things like recognize that the one on the right is a bunch of black in the middle, even though it's still in a white hot dog uh, box, it's not actually a hot dog. Um, it's the same idea, but it's uh, that's how image recognition and detection works. Of course, it depends upon having a good training set, otherwise it can be easily confused. One of the memes that you might see out there on LinkedIn or elsewhere is this one where they're trying to compare muffins to chihuahuas. And you can see how the uh, image training set could be easily confused on this if we're always looking for three dark dots on a beige or brown background, um, the, the data set's going to be confused. So now a little bit about how AI and machine learning, these types of topics, have been included in the world of psychometrics. So uh, years ago, I took a course on data science from Johns Hopkins University on the Coursera platform. Uh, Johns Hopkins is a, a famous university here in the United States. Um, and I got only three minutes in. Uh, you can see on the bottom uh, just how far the uh, playback uh, is. And one of the examples they brought up, brought up of early machine learning was the g-factor from psychometrics. So I took a screenshot of uh, the professor there. And so what they're talking about here is, you know, back in the 1920s and 30s when they were pretty much inventing factor analysis to look at the structure of intelligence and look at the structure of personality, that was actually one of the first applications of unsupervised machine learning in the world. Um, and it was actually very, very groundbreaking and led to some pretty important advancements in the world of psychometrics. And, you know, factor analysis is, of course, used elsewhere now, too. But Charles, Charles Spearman, who was doing that work back then, says, hey, you know, note that machine learning and psychometrics here is not exactly brand new material because he was doing this 100 years ago, literally. Uh, since then, we've branched out into other types of AI, machine learning, and psychometrics. Item response theory is an example of that uh, because regression models are really an important component of machine learning model uh, of machine learning. And you can see here that uh, item response theory is actually logistic regression based. So it is a kind of machine learning. We're trying to make sense out of data, find certain patterns, find a model that can approximate those patterns and be used to solve real life problems. That's machine learning and that is item response theory. Another example in assessment is selection and admissions tests. Uh, you know, here's an example from a research paper on what are the uh, best predictors of job performance. And they looked at things like biodata, cognitive ability assessments, conscientiousness in a non-cognitive personality assessment, uh, actual human interview, an integrity test, and then the overall multiple R of predicting job performance based upon all of these. Um, and you can see that, you know, bio data didn't really add very much to the corrected matrix, uh, but the cognitive ability test, interview, and integrity had some pretty good predictive power here. And when you add them all together, it got up to be 0.75, which is pretty good. Again, it's regression-based type analysis, which makes it a machine learning type of analysis. And we've been doing this type of thing in psychometrics and assessment for 80 plus years. Another example is adaptive testing. So the man on the left is um, Simon Manet. He was a psychologist in Paris more than 100 years ago. And he was one of the first developers of intelligence assessments. And basically what he did was write questions for uh, young kids at like a five-year-old level, a seven-year-old level, eight, nine, ten-year-old level. Um, and then if you were a ten-year-old and came in, he would start you by giving you a ten-year-old question. If you got it right, he'd give you an eleven-year-old question. If you got it right, he'd give you a twelve-year-old question. If you got it wrong, he'd give you an 11-year-old question. And that was how he was trying to find out the mental age, which eventually became our concept of IQ. Well, you can see by my description there, he was actually giving an adaptive test. And uh, what we now know today as computerized adaptive testing just takes that same thing that he was doing and automates it using machine learning models based upon item response theory. So really, what we're doing there is applying artificial intelligence because we're using machine learning models to do what previously could only be done by a human. 
Some other uh, work that's been going on in the field is template-based AIG, which you can see an example here of developing a CPR question. Uh, this is more of automation than AI and machine learning, but it's still useful within the field. Uh, there are many other topics that have been done over the past you know, 20, 50 years, plagiarism detection, ending item detection, automatically categorizing items, uh, implementing factor analysis, structural equation modeling, automated test assembly. If you go to psychometric uh, conferences, you'll see work on all these things. And really, when you get down to it, they're all applying machine learning and AI to solving measurement problems. So what are some current topics that are being worked on? Uh, we'll start by continuing uh, previous research. You know, the research that's going on with adaptive testing, IRT, factor analysis, uh, on all those things, that's still ongoing. We're still inventing new IRT models. We're still inventing new adaptive testing models, uh, trying to make them uh, more efficient and provide better feedback to students. Uh, example of that is in including item response times as part of your IRT model and adaptive testing algorithms. You know, when we were analyzing paper exams with IRT 30 years ago, we didn't have item response times because, of course, they were paper exams. Now when we give the exam online, we know how many seconds each student is spending on each question, and that is some important data that we could incorporate into our item response theory models and therefore into scoring. So there's still plenty of work going on here. A uh, more recent implementation of AI in uh, assessment is remote proctoring. Uh, uh, not all remote proctoring requires AI. You know, some of it is human-based um, because really AI can only tell you after the fact. Uh, so if somebody steals your exam while taking it, AI will probably find out that, but you won't know until the next day or you know a couple hours later when you see the report. You can't stop them in real time, but if you have a live human, you can stop them in real time while they're cheating. Uh, the way AI works is by using image recognition algorithms like I talked about before with hot dog, not hot dog, but breaking it down to a bunch of very specific things that the algorithm is trying to detect. Um, for example, is there a phone within the screen? Are there two faces or two humans within the screen? Are there no faces? Is there one face, but it's an averted gaze? Um, is there a book? Is there a piece of paper? Uh, are there voices? All these types of things that you can easily break down into detectable algorithms. So it's not like some big overall AI Terminator watching you. AI remote proctoring really just breaks it down into these specific things. So you can see here, I've got a, a screenshot of a video that I pulled off of YouTube from a researcher, I think it was at Michigan State University. And you can see they're looking at uh, probability of text, probability of voice, probability of gaze uh, aversion, probability that there's a phone within the screen, probability that there is a face or two faces. And you can see they're combining all of these into an overall probability of cheat, which is the bottom one. And it's saying that, you know, for the first couple seconds, there was no cheating, and then it went very high because there was a second person within the screen. That's how AI proctoring works. Automated essay scoring is another important advancement. Um, it's actually been around for 20, 30 years, um, but it was previously only usable by the large billion dollar assessment companies because you had to write all the code to do it yourself. Now it's fairly easy to implement code like this using things like Python or R. Um, and now essay scoring is something that's more available to many more organizations. Uh, how does essay scoring work? Well, we start by having uh, labeled essays and unlabeled essays. So that means that you have to have some of the essays scored by humans. You can't just start with a bunch of unscored essays. You have to define your ru scoring rubrics. You have to have humans rate them. Um, then you put the student essays into an actual language processing module, which, like I said before, turns text into usable data. Um, then we find some things in that data that we like. It can be something really simple like word count, how many words did each student use, or something a lot more complex like, uh, you know, flesh Kincaid reading level or something like that, um, and turning those into features. Feature here means a predictive uh, variable, um, and labels mean criterion variables. So if you're familiar within the world of psychology of having predictors and criterions, in machine learning they just call them features and labels. It's the same idea. Uh, then automated essay scoring will take machine learning uh, components um, you know, like libraries and software and use that to find the features that are most predictive of your label, in this case scores from the humans, and use that to develop a new model. And then with that you can uh, rescore the existing students or score the students that have no labels yet that haven't been scored. Now this approach is really borrowed from other applications of NLP and AI. 
Uh, one that we all use every day, often without knowing it these days, is spam email detection, uh, which is what you see here. So uh, what spam email detection has been trained over time uh, by people flagging as items yes, spam, or no spam to look for keywords that are more, much more likely to be within spam emails, such as having a price, having percent off, having the word free, having item, uh, words in all caps, having attachments um, where there shouldn't be attachments, especially with unrecognized uh, extensions. All these things are predictive of having spam. Another new area of AI is computational psychometrics, which is really the merging of adaptive testing with adaptive learning to create a single unified uh, approach to uh, e-learning. And while this is real, is getting a lot of new attention and is a, a cutting edge thing, it's actually been around for a while. Uh, Richard Ferguson, I have a picture there, uh, he's previously the CEO of ACT Inc. in one of the largest testing companies in the United States. His 1969 thesis at the University of Pittsburgh was on computational psychometrics about integrating adaptive testing with adaptive learning. Another uh, new thing that's being worked on is process data, uh, which is taking into account that we now have more complex item types like drag and drop. And rather than just looking at whether people get a drag and drop question right, uh, we can look at which things they're drag and dropping first, or you know whether they use things like a calculator or scratch work paper or not, uh, or you know do they move things after they initially move on to the answer, in this case, a number line? Do they then move A and B somewhere else? There are so many things that go into rather than just did they get it right in A and B being correct when they click the submit button. And you can use those uh, log files that track all that information and you've got essentially big data data sets then. You can use that to do research into how students not only are answering the question and can score it, but you can use it to provide feedback to students on you know, learning about what types of errors students are making and uh, consider that as part of your e-learning. So how can AI help us more? Uh, well, one important thing is that to remember that technology is certainly going to kill jobs. Uh, but historically, it has created better ones. The classic example when you look at AI and technology is agriculture. It used to be that the vast majority of humans were employed in agriculture. And when technology came to automate their work, like tractors and threshers and combine harvesters, all of those farmers were out of a job. But did that destroy our economy? No, it really just meant that the next generation moved into cities, got jobs in factories. Um, that Those became uh, automated. The next generation got white collar jobs and there are now a lot less people working in factories. AI is gonna affect those white collar jobs. That is absolutely for sure. But the question is, uh, you know, where are they going to go? We don't know yet, but history has shown us that it's not necessarily gonna be a bad thing that AI is going to take all of our jobs. There are gonna be new jobs. We just don't know what they are yet. You know, AI machine learning engineer is you know, our data scientist. Those are jobs that are very common right now that 30 years ago when you know most people were working in factories, we wouldn't have dreamed up. Uh, one of the cutting edge topics, of course, anybody familiar with AI and machine learning these days is ChatGPT and large language models. Um, and that is one of the you know, cutting edge things that is gonna lead us into the next generation of AI and assessment. So first of all, what is a large language model? Well, they're machine learning models that are used to predict next words or similar words. Um, so those of you who have ever made a text on your phone and you can see above the keyboard, it's suggesting the next three words while you're texting. Well, that's based upon a large language model that's trying to predict the next word based upon the word that, last word that you used. And um, that's the same kind of thing that is used when ChatGPT is writing an essay or you know creating content like that. They're trying to predict the next word that would be used, but they're also looking farther off in the future. Um, it's also how Google can recognize similar terms. Um, so there's a, a model called BERT that Google developed years ago to recognize similar terms more efficiently. Um, and I had an example of that uh, on my website in that I had a page for, uh, on adaptive testing and a page on adaptive assessment. Um, and the adaptive assessment page was receiving uh, traffic for people that were searching for adaptive assessment. And one day I looked at it on a Google search and I realized that Google results had changed the title from adaptive assessment 
to adaptive testing because uh, I recognized that was a similar term. And my SEO results were hurting then because Google thought that I had two pages on the exact same thing. Well, it's because they had changed one of the titles on it without me being notified. Um, and that was causing severe problems. So I was able to merge the two pages and my SEO results on Google have gone up since. Um, that's a good example of how Google's recognizing similar terms. Uh, these uh, LLMs are often used to drive chats. So those chatbots that we see about, um, they're often driven by the LLMs. And they're going to be based upon what they learn in a corpus. Um, so that's uh, essentially that training set that I talked about before, like the pictures of chihuahuas and muffins. Imagine that training set being massive, massive sets of human text, like all of the words on Wikipedia in uh, that those sorts of things. So these types of corpuses are being fed into large language models, which is why it has the name large language models, because they're using things like all of Wikipedia, um, and using that to drive uh, the language models, which are then used to drive the AI for content generation like ChatGPT. This, of course, then still comes back to how good is the corpus, like we talked about with the uh, pictures of the chihuahuas versus the muffins. Um, if the corpus doesn't have good data going into it, the large language model is not going to learn about it very well. Um, but it's going to get smarter as we add more and more data into the large language model and update it. So a great example of this is that uh, last December when ChatGPT came out, which is version 3.5 actually, um, I asked it some questions about item response theory and other things. And its results really weren't all that accurate. It was throwing out some key words that were relevant. But any psychometrician that was reading it would recognize that what I was saying was not correct. Absolutely. Um, but I tried again with ChatGPT4, which came out in March 2023, and the results were a lot better. Um, and of course, you think about all of the corpus that's out there, there probably isn't very much that had been fed into it on item response theory, because that's a pretty niche topic. It's busy learning about other things like the history of the United States and um, digital marketing and so many other topics in the world um, that it wasn't focused on IRT, but it's gotten better. So now it's able to do some pretty interesting things. Um, last week, I asked ChatGPT to write me a sonnet on why it's awesome to be a psychometrician. And you can see the results here. It was actually pretty good. It, it, it followed sonnet and it made sense, you know, talked about things that go into being a psychometrician. Um, you can use it for direct assessment based things too. So here I asked it to write me a 300 page essay about the uh, history of India and then write me five multiple choice questions about it. And um, I'm not an expert on the history of India, so I can't comment on the accuracy of these questions. Uh, but the point here is that it did this in like 10 seconds. Um, so that even if it does require a human to come by and review it, it is still far more time efficient than having a human write this up in uh, from scratch and write those questions from scratch about it. Uh, it still isn't exactly perfect though. Uh, you know, I asked it to write some questions about item response theory. Um, and here's one of the questions about item response theory. And as a psychometrician, I would say that the ICC is actually used to do all of these things. It you know, it's not directly used, but it contributes to all of these things. Um, so it's still not the best question, and it's a good example of why even if you're using uh, AI to develop new questions, they absolutely need to be reviewed by humans. Uh, here's another example uh, from my team working on this. Uh, we asked them to create some mathematics questions uh, with a single correct answer, and uh, they gave us a result that had two solutions. You can see there x equals 1 and x equals 3, and the person working on this replied to ChatGPT, hey, hey, I said you can only have one correct answer, one correct response, because these are to be used on a test. ChatGPT says, oh, I apologize for the mistake. Here's a corrected question. They made a new version of it, um, supposedly. But if you look at it, the new version um, still has that same result, which does have two correct answers. Uh, and even though ChatGPT has gotten better, it's still not exactly perfect. So uh, here's an example. I, asked it to write about cognitive diagnostic models. Most of this is right. Um, you know, I take issue with the fact that it says IRT is a foundation. Um, you know, some cognitive diagnostic models are really off on their own. They don't use IRT as a foundation, but you know, 
it is kind of correct. There are the IRT does play a role in, in to some extent. So, is ChatGPT and our other language models like that worth it? Well, think about it this way: uh, the current pricing is 0.2 cents, you know, uh, of a tiny fraction of a U.S. dollar per 1,000 tokens. And a token is about 0.75 words on average. So you think about that previous example I gave you, um, where let's say a multiple choice question is 50 words and we tell it to write a 500 word passage. Um, and then we're going to have 10 items at 50 items, 50 words each. Well, that's about a thousand tokens then, which means we just got a 500 word passage and 10 decent multiple choice questions for $0.002. Um, the costs here are just astronomically reduced when we're talking about content generation for e-learning and assessment. Yes, we still need to review these. Everyone has to be reviewed by a human. But if you look at this from this perspective, what are the costs of developing a new item make? It's drastically reduced. What are some other things in the future of AI for an assessment? Well, we can certainly apply LLMs to other assessment issues. How do we score? How do we deal with process data? How do we find cheating? Um, how do we evaluate essays? You know, these things are still new. Um, there's still a lot more that can be done with the adaptive learning and adaptive assessment integration. Um, that is still a relatively new, even though, like I pointed out, it's that topic has been investigated since 1969. We didn't really have the technology framework foundation to be doing what we need to do there until recently. Um, there's going to be new CAT algorithms, especially non-IRT ones. Uh, we can now implement things like decision trees and random forests and XGBoost into developing CAT algorithms. Um, everything's going to become more widespread and accessible. Great example there is, like I said, about automated essay scoring. It used to be only be done by the billion dollar giant testing companies. Now you can write an automated essay scoring system with 100 lines of free code. Um, it's very, very easy to do. Uh, remote proctoring is going to become more widespread and more accepted, and the price of it is going to go way, way down. Um, and process data is going to be used more often, especially uh, for the you know learning aspect of things, but that's still new. And finally, remember that uh, AI is always going to be about two years ahead of us. Yeah, think of what, like I said, the concept of Pong was amazing in the 1970s that the computer can pay against doing Pong. Now we would take something like that for granted. And so think about what would have qualified as awesome in 1995 now is something that we take for granted now. And something that's going to happen in 10 years is something that we think is incredibly awesome now. Um, so the article on AI on uh, Wikipedia gives this tip by Quesler's theorem that AI is whatever hasn't been done yet. We're always thinking a couple years ahead, uh, and it's often the things that we haven't even imagined yet. So thank you for uh, attending this session uh, or listening to this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at thompsonassess.com or look me up on LinkedIn and connect with me there. Um, I love hearing about people that are interested in applying AI and uh, machine learning to make psychometrics more effective. Thank you.